Uh, please join me in prayer as we just uh, seek God today. Uh, Father God, we just thank you again uh, just for continuing to be in our lives, uh, just filling us with all the blessings that we can see and those that we can't see. Uh, thank you for just the worship team continuing to help prepare our hearts uh, to seek you and to be filled by your love. Uh, we just continue to pray for all uh, the wisdom and understanding and, the, and really knowing how deep and how wide your love can be, how impactful it is to us and to all those around us. So we just uh, really pray that your words will go deep in our hearts and fill us with love that we just can't contain and we'll share it with everybody. And so we just pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Yeah, it's been about two weeks, so nice to see everybody again. Nice two weeks vacation. Uh, I got the stool up here because now that I'm rested, I'm going to do like an hour Sunday. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'll try not to. All right. Uh, so we're going to be looking at Ephesians. We're going to be continuing in there in chapter 4, verse 1 through 16. Uh, so basically, it's a bigger section, right? You, you'll see that, but it's, it's two sections that are important. The first section is the purpose of the church, and then really the second section is the means in which we accomplish it, right? And so uh, it's right there on the handouts with you, and it's to be on the screen. You can read it with me. It says, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he had, he had led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And so here, right, I, I bolded the last part. He kind of then tells you, right, like we're going to, the whole point of the body is to be united in a way that we actually build ourselves up in love. Uh, and so for the most part, when we read this, right, do we really believe that love can change? Do we really believe that just loving something uh, will make it become what it's supposed to be. When we read this, you know, we're, we're looking at Paul's prison letters, right? And we read it over and over again. We see it. He talks over and over how he's enduring suffering. He's enduring all these things. And yet he's counting it all joy. He's so excited. He's so thankful for them, right? He's thankful in all circumstances. Everything's possible. He keeps telling them their love, their faith, their, uh, their unity, right? How they keep praying for him. All those things are fueling him to be the happiest he's ever been. And really, he's saying this while he's in prison. That's what's crazy about it. All these letters, right? We're looking at prison letters. He's saying over and over again, the love of you, of all of you, is making it so easy for me. Your love is inspiring me to stand true, stay true to the faith and finish strong and be ready to testify to everybody about Jesus. And so when we read that, we see he's telling them how powerful love can be. But do we really believe that? Who believes love can change anybody? All right, that's more than I thought. All right, who believes, uh, who's willing to die for love? That, that it could help change somebody. Okay, all right, that's what all right, I like the change, right? But right, if you believe in love so much, that's a true test. Will you die for it? Will you live for it? Will you all, is that all you'll get? You'll live your life to make sure that, that they get the love. That's when you know you believe it. Most of us, we didn't raise our hands. We're not willing to die for love because we don't really see how much it really means, right? Or how much, what it can really do. Uh, so this is where it's important to understand. Paul is trying to give us this example of what it, what it really looks like for love to bring somebody back to life. 
So the verse in 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 9, he tells them, right? For do not, for we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the afflictions we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Paul is, you know, most of the people, they knew all the stories about him getting whipped. They knew he was in jail, right? It wasn't a secret. This was pub, it was well-known public information, what he was going through. And he's telling them, he says over and over, like, I, was, I basically felt like I had the death sentence, right? Like, I'm living, I'm, I'm dead right now. And so when you see him talk about how much joy he had, how much he's content, it's in balance with this right here. What he's going through made it feel like it's death, but their love brought him back to life. Isn't that pretty cool, right? Like he's literally showing them, love can bring me back to life. And so it's not just Paul. It's not just the group that was back then that they could do that. This is what all churches are supposed to be able to do, right? Sometimes we think like, oh, it's because it's Paul, right? He was such a special teacher. His believers are so strong. Yeah, their love is able to bring him back to life. But we don't have Paul. We don't have that kind of teaching. We're not that strong, right? We can't do that. But Paul didn't write this just for us. He wrote this for everybody. This is what it means. Right? All the other apostles, all these people that were suffering, getting whipped, they, they had that love fueling them, and they were willing to die for that love. And so it's important to understand and have that full hope and love that it can really bring somebody back to life. That's why we love. That's why we do it. And so I'm going to try to do a little bit of a different sermon today. It's going to be a more testimonial, and then uh, I'll, I'll wrap it up with some teaching. Right? Uh, I'll just give the warning. I'm not very good at sharing uh, my emotions or uh, sharing some of the stuff, uh, especially not with a big group, right? Normally, these are smaller conversations or usually with people that we've gone through a lot. Um, but basically, uh, this whole living death that Paul talks about, right, that he felt that. If you know soldiers, this is something that we deal with all the time. And so um, most of you guys have heard the stories I've done in war, all this stuff. And most of you guys are like, man, like, it's crazy how much he's done. He wasn't scared of death or all this other stuff, right? Soldiers are not scared of death. And there's a reason why. Because once we go to war, we're already dead. There's no coming back. We're never the same, right? Everybody that goes to war, they're never the same when they come back. Uh, to die and have your life end quickly is the best thing for us. Because it's quick, it's fast. We can go out in a blaze of glory. We can die with honor. It's very fast. It's, very, it's good and clean. That's what we want. Because the alternative is what we call the living death. That's what we fear. Where we survive the war but we're not the same when we come back, right? So there's three ways you can have a living death. It's physical, mental, and spiritual. The physical death is when you get all kinds of, you know, messed up, right? You see guys get paralyzed. You see them, you know, from the legs down, uh, from the neck down, they, they, they can't, they lose all their things. They lose limbs, stuff like that. Uh, once you lose all those parts, right, or you can't, you lose the function of your body, the life that you lived before is gone, right? Some people were athletes. Some people were all these things like, oh, I'm going to do this later on. or I'm going to do all these adventures, right? I'm, out going, I'm an outdoors person. Guess what? There ain't no wheelchair ramps outdoors, right? You can't do that stuff no more. It's taken away from you. And so that's where you're like, you now have to live a life that you never wanted to live. And so that's where there's that physical death. Sometimes people get burned, right? Very severely. There's guys that they're married, right? So their wife, you know, they fell in love with them. And, and you know, when they come back, they're all disfigured. Those marriages don't last. Why? Because that wife is just too hard to take. Does that make sense? Some of the guys just leave the wives because they don't want that wife to have to put up with that, right? They're like, you don't deserve this. And so that's what they look at it. Like, our lives are over if that stuff happens. There, there's many of deaths like that. Um, you know, even some of the tolls on your body, right? The physical toll, everything. You know, they always say, like, you ain't going to be able to play with your kids no more, right? Like, all these type of things. You'll only be able to do it for a little while. Uh, it's it's, it's the, the toll of how much the, that it takes on your body of what you do. Uh, and this is not like a hypothesis, right? This is real. My dad reached a certain age, couldn't play with us no more, right? When I, he just he couldn't keep up. His body would not allow him to. He tried to find other ways to, to play with us. He tried to do video games and stuff, but it just it wouldn't work. I mean, he couldn't play sports with us. Uh, so I remember that. That was, you know, a tough moment, right? As a kid, you love playing with your dad. And at some point, he couldn't play no more. Uh, and so there's that physical death. There's also the mental death where, obviously, you know, there's a lot of brain damage, things like that, things that happen to people where you might just come back a vegetable. You might be alive, but the, the, the explosions and things like that, you'll never be awake again. Or you might just barely have limited function. Uh, even, even if you don't have that happen to you, there's a lot of damage that comes from all the blasts, right? It, it messes up your brain. It rewires it. 
Some people become addicted to adrenaline, where it's like you have, you, you get so much adrenaline, your body needs it. You can't live a normal life no more, right? Like everything just becomes so boring, so dull. Like you just have to chase extremes just to be able to feel normal, right? There's people that, um, they, the, when you get the, the TBIs, traumatic brain injuries, you start losing self-control. And so that's where a lot of them, they start turning to alcohol, drugs, things like that, right? They can't, they can't stop that self. A lot of times they lose self-control with anger. There's no way they can stop being angry. Some of them, you have to be angry just to be able to kill somebody, right? You, most people can't just fight. Uh, so they have to just hate somebody as much as they can and you can't turn it off, right? Once you turn, once you turn that on, you can't turn it off. And so you come back, you're never the same. You're, you, you can't control your anger no more. I had a friend of mine, uh, one of the nicest guys, right? Very kind dude. Um, he, he did a bunch of multiple, he did a couple of deployments. Uh, and when he finally came back and when he was out, you know, he ended up, uh, you know, yelling at his wife, right? He was yelling at her, the, uh, the neighbors called the cops, you know, the domestic, potential domestic, right? He was grabbing her arm. And so in his mind, he was like, dang, like, it's only going to get worse, right? Like, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to lose more and more control. And I never want to hurt my wife. So basically, he grabbed his gun, walked outside, and started shooting above the cops. That way, they could kill him, right? It was they call it death by cop, where it was kind of like he didn't, he didn't want to. He knew he was dead already. He didn't want to take his wife with him, right? He was kind of like, I'd rather make sure I never hurt him. And so, you know, why do I know that? It's because we talked about that. All of us, we have that plan where it's like, what happens if we get so far gone? Do we just remove ourselves, right? This is why you see so many suicides from veterans, why there was 22 a day for well over 10 years for that reason. They'd rather take themselves away. Why there's so many homeless vets? They're afraid to hurt their families, so they just isolate themselves. They, they, they die by themselves. That way they don't hurt their people, right? And so that's why I say, like, it's something that all of us talk about, that mental death. And then there's the spiritual death where sometimes you have to do things that you can never live with ever again, right? Sometimes you have to make tough choices. Sometimes you have to do things that are so immoral. And the tough part is, is that it's sanctioned by the government, right? It's not illegal. You're given orders, you got to do it. And so this is where it messes with people, where they were like, man, I, sh I knew better. I shouldn't have done that. And so then all of a sudden, you can never forgive yourself. You can never feel like you're ever going to be forgiven. Uh, me and my dad were talking about this last week, where we have a lot of friends like that, right? They did, they did work for the CIA, things like that, where the government wanted certain things done and, you know, nobody could stop it. And so the stuff that that guy did, he don't, he don't ever feel he could ever be forgiven. No matter how much we talk to him as believers and saying like, no, it's all good. He can't, he can't accept it. And I know that why he can't accept it because of what, those, what he had to do, right? And so I've had friends like that. that was, he, he was up in my dad's era, uh, but I have friends like that, the same thing. They had to do certain things that uh, there's no coming back from. No matter how much you share, uh, it's just that tough, right? That's what war does. Sometimes um, you, when you lose a good friend or you, you see people die in painful ways, they snap and just kill a bunch of people out of revenge. It's a flash thing. It's an instant. But once you do that, there's no coming, right? You, you can never trust yourself again. You feel like, man, I'm so horrible. Like, look what I just, I killed innocent people, right? And so it's like, I, I, it's hard not to judge them. But at the same time, it's hard not to understand when they saw what they saw, the traumatic way their friends died, it's hard not to just unleash. Does that make sense? And so, but at the same time, you, you know, like, they're never going to be the same. And so there's always, there's these three ways that we could die. There's these three ways where it's like, there's a living death that over time, you just get worse and worse and worse. And so uh, for me, I've known this my whole life. I knew, I knew it going into the Army. Uh, for you guys, you know, you guys grew up in this community, right? You, you, are, you bond on certain things. You like the same things, stuff like that. You're, you're very, you know each other very well. And you go to the same colleges, things like that, right? Same programs. It's all, you're intertwined. The community I grew up in, uh, it was all military veterans. Probably over 90% of the people I met were all vets, right? Because of my dad, uh, you know, we met, I met them all. I met all those homeless people I told you guys about doing ministry like that. Uh, my dad used to train people for a second careers. And so a lot of it, there were all these vets, right? They had damage and stuff like that. They couldn't ever continue their original careers so for whatever reason, right? So all the people I met, most, a lot of them were trying to start over. They needed to learn how to do a new life, right? So my dad was willing to train them and stuff like that. Uh, but that's what I grew up with. Every single per, uh, uh, all these different wars, people from all the different wars, even from different countries, all the military, right? K uh, Korean army, Vietnam, Vietnamese, Indian army, uh, people from Africa. Right, African armies. And so that's where it was like, that's what I knew. That's all I knew was that this is what comes with that choice. That's what comes with this lifestyle. Right. And so as much as I wish, <laughs> as much as I thought I could avoid it, uh, could not avoid it. Right. And so for myself, uh, 
the, all three of those areas, I've already died in all three of those areas, right? So even though I'm alive physically, uh, I've, I've been sharing, right, all the struggles of, of the things like that. But honestly, uh, I've shared with, a little bit with each people here, but for the most part, all across the board, I have all those three of those deaths, right? And so there's actually uh, evaluations that they give you, right? The veterans hospitals, they evaluate you how, how uh, disabled you are, how much you've lost. And so for me, I'm actually 80% disabled based on their ratings. And the only reason why I'm 80% is because a lot of the injuries I sustained were not recorded in time. So sometimes you, when you get hurt, you have to report it, right, and step aside. Sometimes we still needed to keep going. There were still missions to do. And so I just sacrificed and said, don't matter if I get covered or don't matter. Uh, if it gets worse, I'm going to go do this for my, my people. Does that make sense? And so uh, it's well beyond 80%. That's all they'll cover me for because those, those injuries aren't recorded. Uh, and at the same time, they actually didn't measure brain functions back then. After they measured brain functions after my first deployment. Uh, so all the damage from the first three years wasn't recorded to see how much I dropped. But they were able to measure how much I dropped. Right. And so this is where it's kind of like all the x-rays, all the examinations of my body, all that sort of stuff. They can see every single area that is dead. Does that make sense? This is this is gone. This is gone. Uh, these symptoms mean this. Right. I told I was telling the people like the only reason why I'm not hired is because they're like, you don't have enough violent episodes in your <laughs> right? And so I was like, OK, like I don't know if they're encouraging me to be more violent to get more ratings. But uh, but that, that's what I said. Right. Like it's crazy. Like um, where. It's not something that I'm just making up. It's not what I'm feeling. It's this is documented, right? It's all there on paper, all there by these doctors, all there by the counselors and stuff like that. And so um, for me, right, these last couple of years, uh, it has been a struggle. It has been a struggle in so many different ways, trying to overcome all three of those areas, uh, trying to fight back. Um, for me, I was always like a very big dreamer, right? If you knew me as a kid or in my 20s, most people compared me to the Bible character Joseph. Right. Most people, some of you are like, oh, he's probably like David because he fought. Everybody knew me as Joseph because how much I love to dream, how much I believe. And I went all out for it. Right. Like nonstop. And so now, you know, it's, it's like I said, that fueled by hope. Now I don't dream. Right. I don't try to dream. I was sharing with people like there's one fear I have right now. And honestly, that fear, I don't uh, the fear. My fear is to dream. The reason why, like, as I try to dream about something right now, right, there's something that seems like really special that I, that I want. Uh, is there's just all these negative voices in my head. No way you can have that, or you're gonna. You, there's no way you can keep that. There's no way you can sustain that, or you'll never be that person that'll be able to do it, right? Like it's crazy. I was like, why am I talking myself out? All right, it's just you know. But that's that was the reality. Like that's the reality, right? I don't have. I don't. I didn't have the hope that I could ever get better. I didn't have the hope that I was gonna get stronger. I just had that belief, like I'm gonna get worse. Uh, well, it's not a belief. It's what I've known, right? That's my reality. Every person I knew growing up, every person I I saw, they always got worse. That that that's the way it works. And so. Um, you know, even when I took the job here, I remember doing the interview and they're like, we want you long term, right? Like, you know, you know, can you, would you be willing to do long term? In my mind, I was like, they were like, maybe four, or six, seven years. In my mind, I was like, I don't even know if I'll be alive that long. I don't even know if I'll be able to be around people that long, right? And so I was like, yes. <laughs> right? When they asked, I was like, yes, I can do it. Uh, and I wasn't trying to lie. It was more like uh, the little bit of confidence. I'm, I'm confident, borderline arrogant, right? And so when they asked me, I was like, I think I could do it. <laughs> I was like, I, I, maybe I'll do it, uh, or I'll give, I'll give my best, and whatever happens, you know, I'll, I'll step away when, it, when the time is right. And so, but that's why I was like, I'm maybe five percent sure I'll be able to last that long. Maybe ten, max twenty, right? Twenty. All I had left in my life, or all I have left in my body is twenty percent. And so, um, so even as I was always struggling with, you know, taking care of myself, things like that, the youth we had talked about, like it's okay to get help, you know. But one of the reasons I was worried about ever like getting help from the vets is like, once, they, once you're really bad, they actually isolate you and put you somewhere. They set you up, right, financially, and set you up, all this other stuff. And so I was like, if I ever take care of, if I really, really confront all my stuff, they're just gonna put me away and I'll just be on my own, right? Like I could, I'll just live in the woods or have my own little farm. Uh, but that's, that's all I have, right? And so I was like, I don't wanna do that yet, right? I'm gonna try to give as much as I can. And so, uh, but being here, that's, that was, the hope was just to last as long as I can. Does that make sense? It wasn't like, I'm gonna be uh, able to do everything. And so, um, when, you know, when we see this by Paul, he talks about this. We know that, right? There's sacrifices, all these things. Um, it, it's, 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 it sucks to live like that. It's, it sucks to live where you don't have the hope or you're, you're robbed. You feel like you're dead. Um, I remember as a, when I left for the Army, I left June 24th. That was the day I shipped out. Uh, June 23rd, I had dinner with my family, and I said my goodbyes that night. 
I was like, I don't want to see you guys in the, I was supposed to leave at 4 a.m. I was like, I don't want to see you guys in the, in the morning. Uh, it's going to be easier for me just to do it at night, right? And, I, and I'll take off. And so I said my goodbyes June tw- on, on the 23rd. So as soon as midnight hit, uh, when my family was asleep, I ended up leaving the house. And I, uh, I kind of broke into the preschool that I, that I grew up in. Right? I did some trespassing. <laughs> I jumped over the fences and stuff. And so I wanted to go to the playground. Right? I, was, I was just sitting on the playground having like a moment. Because uh, that's where it all started for me. That was where my life, you know, when I, when I uh, saw all those kids in, in pain and were getting hurt, I beat up the whole preschool. Right? And that's when I learned about God saved my life. That's when I learned about the strength he gave me. And that's when I learned his purpose for my life, right, to be a soldier. And so uh, when I was in, in that uh, preschool, I, I ended up imagining having a conversation with my five-year-old self. Uh, so this is why I say I'm an introvert, because I like to have conversations with myself. Uh, but basically, I was talking to my five-year-old self, right? Like, I've done, you know, your dream was to be a soldier. Your dream was to go off and fight for people. And it's like I've spent the last 13 years preparing to be that, to be who you wanted to be. Uh, some of you guys are like, you know, you guys hear all the stories how wild I was in middle school or high school. The reason why is because I already knew I was going to die once I left, right? Uh, so I was like, I might as well have my fun now before my life's over. And so when I'm talking to my five-year-old self, right, I'm like, yeah, you know, I did everything. I prepared. I'm as strong as I can be. I'm ready to give it all. And so basically what I told my five-year-old self is, today's the day you die. June 24th is the day you die. As soon as I leave, everything about you is going to go away. Everything about you will be stripped away, broken down, uh, in order to fulfill the purpose that you were made for, in order to do what you want to do. And so as I told myself, I was like, I know you're going to die, right? And every, I don't know what I'll be able to keep about you. The one thing I'll keep is your heart to always fight for those that are hurting and those that need protection, right? That'll be my dedication. That's what I'll try to keep from you. And so I was like, I promise I'll always fight with whatever breath I have. With every day I'm given, I will fight until I'm, I'm finally dead. And so I told myself that, and I made that promise to myself. And I asked God to help me keep that promise, right? I was like, God, you are the, I don't need it, I'm all right. Um, I was like, God, you're going to be the reason why I'm able to keep this promise. I, mean? I was like, God, I want to keep this promise for you. You made me to fight. You made me uh, to be able to give my life, right? When I saw Christ, I saw the same thing, right? Christ was willing to suffer everything. He was willing to do it all. All those veterans that I grew up with, that's all the sacrifice that they made, they would do it again, right? They're like, we died for other people. We died for freedom. We died for all that. And so... To me, there was no greater way to die, right? I was like, why not? Like, why not give everything I have so that other people don't have to experience this? If I can give all my all, less people have to die, right? And so uh, I, I, made, I made that promise to myself and God, and I went off into the army and did everything I could, right? And I, I, I took every challenge on. I fought every fight. Um, so many people told me, like, don't do it, right? Save yourself, save your body, right? All these different things. And it's kind of like every time I just, just think of Christ, right, and all the people that I knew, they would make that sacrifice, and so I did it over and over again. Never worried about the future. Never worried about uh, having to live with it, right? I would joke with people where it's like, after I would risk my life, I'd look around like, dang it, why didn't I die, right? I was like, come on, God. I was like, this was such a perfect chance. It would have been easy, and he just, he just made me live on. Um, and so, you know, but so for so many years, right, it's been like that where I don't have the hope. Uh, most of you are like, every time we see him, he's always so joyful, he's always so happy. Yeah, when I'm serving, when I'm helping people, it's a great joy. It's a great pleasure, right? I, I enjoy it. I, I draw my strength from Christ. But you don't see me every other day. You don't know what I'm like by myself, right? There's days I didn't want to get up. There's days I just have no motivation to do anything, right? There's days I barely eat. I had all kinds of issues sleeping, right? Take me hours just to sleep over and over, right? So most of the time, um, you know, I would only get like four hours of sleep. And so I would try to get, I'd be laying there for like seven, eight hours, but I would only get four, right? And so little by little, it was just getting worse and worse and worse. And so, um, you know, I know what Paul is saying, but the important thing to understand is you have to, if you believe in these words and you have the hope, you start leaving yourself open to seeing what God can do. And so for me, I just like Paul said, he got strength from the love. He got strength from the unity. He got strength from the body of believers. And so I was like, I'm going to try to do the same. I'm just going to pour myself into everything that I do. I'm going to try to love the best way I can. I'm going to try to uh, bring people together as best I can, right, and see what happens. So last year... I, uh, you know, we did the all hawk retreat, right? I pushed myself really hard for three days, uh, nonstop teaching, and then we did a bunch of youth activities, right, all throughout August. Normally, that was supposed to be our break, but I wanted, I wanted us to have fun, and I thought it was important for the group. So I pushed myself super hard all August, and I was like, in September, October, I'm going to have some rest, right? Everything that we've done, I have all the plans laid out. It's going to be super easy for me to rest in September. 
and I'll be able to catch up because I needed it, right? I don't have the strength I had like I used to. And so as I, September came, most of you kind of know that's when our church started going through all its turmoil, right? All the issues with the, the hiring, all the issues with the, the two congregations, right? all this other stuff. And so as, as we're dealing with this, there's so many extra meetings that we have to go to. So I was trying to rest, and now I have all these extra meetings, right, that, that are spiritually draining me. Uh, there was a lot of fear for myself, knowing that a lot of the families that were involved in everything, some of them had youth in the group, right? So I was like, if this happens, they might go that way. This might happen, right? And so trying to deal with that, right, like all that fear, all that stuff, uh, it's not easy as a leader to try to plan around that, right? And so, and at the same time, right, my heart's very tender in a sense. It's like I need, I don't want to lose people, right? And I've told you I've lost so many people. I don't want to lose people. And so as I'm, as I'm going through all that tough time, I'm like, dang, like it just drained me the whole way throughout the whole year. So by the time December hit, I was like, there's no way I can go without a vacation the next year. And so I was like, I'm going to try to find, find a vacation. We'll talk as a staff. Uh, but that, as soon as the new year hit, that's when Pastor Paul needed to step down. Right? And so I knew that was a great choice. It was a great sacrifice to be with his family. Uh, and I was, like, I, I was very inspired by it. So I was like, I'm just going to ask God for a little bit more strength to push my leave off a little bit more. Right? And I was like, I, I know he can help me get through it. I know he can give me something. Uh, whatever happens, happens. Right? But I was worried that now that I'm pushing myself so far, whatever energy level, that 20% I had, it's going to be even lower once I get through that season. Right? It's like, man, I'm really, I don't know what's going to be left of me. And so uh, going into the retreat, the youth retreat, mostly, I don't know if you guys all saw it, but I was teaching like tons of classes weeks going into the retreat. I was doing like two baptism classes a day, doing uh, the, the retreat prep. I was also doing my leaders prep. So it was like four meetings on Sundays, right? All these different things, uh, just giving, 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 right? And so when the retreat came, I was worried in a sense where it's like, man, once I give all this energy, right, I was already, I already had none. I was already worried. And it's like, here, I'm going to give it all. And so now it's like, what will be left of me? Uh, that four, seven, six, seven year vision, it's like, it, it just might end after this, right? Um, and so I was like, all right, God, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do it as best I can, God. Uh, I'm just gonna give it all, no fear of what happens next. And so the amazing thing was, we had such a great time at the retreat. I don't know if you guys noticed when we came back, I even had more energy. Did you guys notice that? <laughs> no. <laughs> So the weeks after the retreat, I made the best meals, right? The best food. Everyone was like, Dad, this food's good. I was making cupcakes. I was making cookies with art, right? I was just having a time. I had all these new games, right? It was like, dang, I'm, I had so much energy coming out of the retreat. And that's where it was kind of like, it's so easy to not think about it. But it's like, wait a minute. Here this dude was on his last leg. He was tired from last year's retreat. And somehow he's still not rested, and yet he walks away with more energy. Why? How? Right? That's why it's like, because it, you know, everything that's there is showing you, I should be gone. I should be broken from it. Yet somehow I have more energy than I've ever had before. How is that possible? And so this is where we see, right, the love of the body, this unity. This is what truly recharges people, right? Because when we were on the retreat, uh, the youth, man, they were doing everything together, right? Cooking, cleaning, they were having fun, games, stayed up late, right? All this other stuff. Right? None of them complained the whole three days. I didn't hear one complaint. Is that not a miracle? Right? That, yeah. <laughs> right? Every parent, like, that's a miracle. The youth, did you guys, are you guys surprised how well you got along at the retreat? Yeah? No? Right? Were you guys not surprised, like, how well it went? Like, how, well you, how you guys actually, like, really bonded? Right? That was, I was like, man, that's, that was impressive. <laughs> you guys are, yeah. right? But that's where I was, that's what I was saying, like, to see that, right, to see how close you guys were. Right? The only complaint I heard was from two of the youth. They were supposed to only spend one night. Uh, they were supposed to come back Saturday because they had some on Sunday. But they were like, man, I'm so, like, we, so, we want to be here the whole time, right? Like, we wish we could stay. So they were able to talk their parents into staying the second night, right? But that was the only complaint. That was the only complaint I heard all weekend. And I was like, man, this is crazy. And so when, by, by seeing that, right, it reminded me of the Acts in Pentecost. When they first get the Holy Spirit, how united they are, all of a sudden, everybody stops caring about themselves and they're worried about everybody else, right? They share everything. We're all one. What's mine is yours. I, I, whatever you need, I'll give you. That's what I felt when I saw you guys the whole time, right? You guys want to share this? Let's share that. Let's go here. Let's go there. Let's do this. Nonstop. Does that make sense? And that's where I was like, when I'm seeing that unity of spirit, seeing everybody just being loving, it's hard not to walk away without being recharged. Does that make sense? Seeing God's love, seeing how he led them, seeing how he brought them together, seeing how much they truly loved each other, how special it was of what they could have together. I walked away stronger. 
that, right? And so this is what I'm trying to say. Like, when we see Paul talk about this, it's real. It's as real as can be that if you truly love and are led by the Spirit to love everybody, you can bring somebody back to life. I'm living proof of that. I can give you all the scientific proof of why I should not do this stuff. Everybody I know will tell you that that's not possible. When I met the doctors, when I told them the key words of where I was and what I did, they instantly stamped max percentages. They're like, you're one of those guys? You were from there? I can't cuss. <laughs> Chris, was, Chris volunteered at BA Hospital. He was talking about where like, all the patients cuss, all the doctors cuss. It's one of the funniest things. I had to cuss a little bit in the doctor's meeting because he wouldn't believe me that I'm a soldier if I'm not swearing, right? Like he, I got a, it's like a confirmation test. Like, are you an imposter, right? And so I had to do a little bit. But it's like when I told him where I was at, he's like, instant, instant, instant. You did this instant, right? Like that, because they know what I've done, what that equals. Does that make sense? And so that's what I'm trying to tell you. you. You have living proof that I should not be what I am. I should not be energized more after giving it all. But yet that's where we know what is possible with God. Right? That's why Paul is saying, everything's possible with God. I'm literally in jail, and I'm having the time of my life. I'm literally in jail, being broken, being whipped, and I'm stronger than ever. Nothing is impossible with God. That's what love can do. That's what unity of spirit can do. Right? For me, I felt like, you know, I used to have a huge fire that gave me all that passion. Right? I felt like all I got left is that little tea light, little tea light candle, or what is it, tea candles, whatever they're called. That's all the flame I got left, right? But being around everybody here, all the love that everybody has, the passion, it's like all of you have lent me that little bit of fire. And it's like that's what my heart is filled with. Does that make sense? The love of, from everybody else. Every little way, every little detail to where it's like, man, I could do things that I've never, or I, it's not possible, or I gave up hope on. Does that make sense? I was, uh, I talked about, right, the physical death where, like, my body was breaking down. And so I've been training and doing different things like that. Uh, two weeks ago, or a couple weeks ago, right before I went on vacation, I was, we went to get Mexican food after service, and uh, I was, uh, Asher and Silas, they wanted me to lift them up, right? And so uh, I, I created something called the parrot hold, where I basically sit the kid on my shoulder like a parrot, right? And so they're just like up there on their own. And so uh, every time I put one of them on my shoulder, the other one's always like, oh, I want to do it too, right? Uh, they want to do it at the same time, but most people are like, no, it's not possible. So the first time I did it and they wanted to do it, I was like, dang, I'm not strong enough now, but I'm going to try, try to train. Right, I'm going to keep training to see if I can get strong enough. So when we went there two weeks ago, I put Asher on first. Right? He's heavy, right? So I put him on first. And so as I have him up there, Silas is looking like, come on, come on, like, lift me up. So somebody told him, like, no, Silas, you got to wait, right? Like, it's, uh, he can't do both of you. And so he's kind of disappointed, like, come on, lift me. So I was like, all right. So I basically, I grabbed him under his arm armpit, right, because he has his arms up. And I just lifted him up at the same time, both of them above my shoulders, right? So when I had both of them up, I started looking at both of them like, ah! Like, I was yelling, like, can you believe this? Right? And where it was like, because they couldn't believe it. They're like, wow, we're both up here, right? Like, they're having the time of their life. And so for me, that's where I was like, being able just to be able to play with them, right? Like, have, lift both of them up when most people can't. And it's like, here I am, supposed to be broken down, not be able to play with kids, all this other stuff. And it's like, I'm so strong, it's dangerous for kids to play with me. Is that what I'm right? Like, it's, it's, it's potentially dangerous. That's how much I've been healed. That's how much I'm brought back to life. Right? That's why I said, like, I saw it with my dad. I did more than my dad. I did way more years than my dad, and I jumped out of planes, which takes even more. He didn't do that. I'm well past the age of how, when he couldn't play with us no more. Right? So even though, like, you know, it seems like simple, oh, he's just picking up kids. Like, that's just fun. It's fun to you, but for me, that's like disbelief. Like, that's another example of God's strength and healing. Does that make sense? When I can lift both of them up, and it's like, dang, the mom's worried. Like, that's cool. Like, you know what I mean? I, I, I would really never drop them. But that's why I dedicated myself to training myself. But just to be able to train and have that strength, like, that's not a given. Right? That's why I said mo most of us are in decline. Most of us have the shoulder joint issues, all that stuff. And so that's what I'm trying to tell you. Like, there's so many ways that you, love can bring somebody back to life. And so uh, hopefully you can, you can see me and say, man, our love can do a lot. Right? Our love can truly save people. It can truly rescue them. That's what God made us to do. And so if you believe it, then you'll fight for it and you'll die for it. All right? So we're going to go into the, the rest of the sermon on the handout. Now I'm ready. Fired up. All right. <laughs> I got through it. All right. So um, the whole point of unity is for Jesus' sake. This love, why we should love each other. If you guys ever read Jesus' final prayer, it's in John 17. 
This is his, they call it the high priestly prayer. When he's in Gethsemane, he's praying to God. Right? It's, one of the, it's a very powerful prayer. You should read the whole thing. I didn't want to put it all here because we already had a lot of verses. But I'm going to give you this highlight. And it says, I do not ask for these only, because he's talking to God, right? He says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given it to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Our love proves Jesus to other people. He's telling you right there. The more you love each other, the more people will believe in me. More people will believe that God sent me. Right? If we're not able to love all those like us, most people aren't going to believe Jesus' power is real. Right? Even for you guys, you were, you're struggling to believe how powerful love can be. Because you haven't seen it yet. You haven't seen what it can do. And that's what I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to be vulnerable and transparent. Where it's like, it can do everything. Right? We can see Jesus' power through the resurrection. Right? All these different things. Through, like I said, myself being resurrected back to life based on love. Based on people being filled with Jesus' love. And so this is Jesus' prayer. This is what he desires. This is what he knows will truly bring people to him. Will, can we love that right way that will build everybody up? Right? Paul is not bringing us something new. He's basically sharing what Jesus' last wish was. I truly pray that they will be perfectly one. That's the standard that we're trying to go to. Our body here is perfectly one. And so as we talk about that, most of you are like, that's going to be hard. <laughs> yes, I agree. It is going to be hard. Every church struggles with this. Every church is not is very rare that you can find this true level. But this is where it's important to understand there's a lot of wisdom on how we can do that. And that's why I read the full section. We're supposed to be one. This is God's wish. And the way we accomplish that is by you trying to grow in every way. It's not you growing somebody else. It's you growing up in every way to be the standard to be just like Christ. And so the last point is you need to love more and then pray more. All of us always say pray more, right? We're always like, we need to pray more, we need to pray more. I like that sentiment, but at the same time, you have to be very careful how you say that, how you word that, what that means for everybody. Usually when you say, I'm going to pray more, you're like, I'm going to pray more for you. I'm going to pray more that you're changed. I'm going to pray more that you see my way. I'm going to pray more that you are behind me. That's not love. That's not a loving prayer. Does that make sense? Loving people is for who they are. Loving people where they're at, what they've gone through. That's love. Jesus did not say, like, I'm going to love you if you do all these things. I'm not going to love you if you think all this way. I love you. I'm going to die for you before you've ever even changed. Does that make sense? That's his, he, this is when he's praying for us. He's praying for us to be loving, uni, unified. Right? He's not telling God, make him, you know, all these other things. Right? I think Pastor Chang a couple weeks ago, I, I saw a sermon where he was talking about when you call your crush. Right? And you use the voice. You guys heard that? Right? So imagine you have, you know, you have this dream girl, dream boy. Right? And you go up to him and you're like, oh, man, I'm so in love with you. Right? Like, Everything about you really, you know, gets me excited and like I want to spend more time with you, right? And it's like, but I need, here's a list for behaviors I need you to change. That way I'll keep loving you, right? Imagine it's your, so you did, somebody gave that to you. You slap him in the face, right? You'd be like, get the hell out of here, right? I'm going to change. <laughs> right? If somebody came up to you, I'm a, I love you right now, but here's a list of behaviors that I'll, so I can continue to love you. You'd be like, that's not love. What are you in love with? Right? You would say, you don't love me. You want me to be what you want me to be. That's not love. So if we know that's not love, if our prayer life has changed everybody else, then that's not love. That's not a loving prayer. Do you think God will answer that prayer? No, right? You, that's why so, so much of the New Testament is like, look inside yourself. Look what you can do. Check yourself first. Right? Or even understand them first. Uh, I was sharing with the, the youth leaders that um, one of the churches I worked with, you know, I've worked with a lot of different cultures, right? And so one of the, cultures, one of the churches I worked with had five languages, and so, but the white, the white congregation was in charge. So we'd always do these big events together, and, they would all, and whenever they had all the five congregations together, it was just hot dogs, right? They would only serve hot dogs. And so the Chinese, the Hispanic 
uh, they used to always have meals every Sunday, right? The white congregation would only do it once a quarter. And so, uh, so the Chinese offered, like, hey, can't we cook our food one time to share our culture, get people to, you know, try our food, right? Because the Hispanics want to do the same thing, right? Most, those cultures love their food. They love to share it. And so the white pastor was like, no, I don't want to eat Chinese food. It smells. It stinks. Right? You guys had the same reaction on youth leaders had. Uh, <laughs> and so when, when he said that, right, the youth leaders are like, that is something that you would hear at your workplace. That's something that you would hear in school, right? You would not expect that in the church. And so when I saw how hurt they were, I was like, dang, right? I always ate the food with all the congregations. The families, the Chinese parents would always bring me Chinese food because uh, I was always with the youth, right? I would never have time to go get meals, so they, they actually brought it to me. And I would eat it. I would happily eat it, right? And so, uh, but this is where I understood, like, working with all these different cultures, seeing where it's like most, I've worked with so many multicultures, with different cultural churches, the, 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 the culture always wants to hold on to itself, right? They always want to hold on to their things. Now, for me, I'm always like, God culture is above. That's what I believe in. That's what I fight for, right? And so they're always holding on to their culture. Now, understanding from my background, I told you guys, my, my own culture disowned me because I embraced other cultures. They said I wasn't Mexican enough, and so they, they kicked me out. So I just was, embraced every other culture, right? That's what I told you. I grew up with all Filipino friends. That was, <laughs> all the Mexicans and whites rejected me. That's what I <laughs> all right. All uh, right. So, but for the most part, right, so I have no dedication to my culture. It's very easy for me to fight for God culture because that's, that's what was the most embracing culture, right? So, yes, my history, I, I, wanna, I don't care about ethnic culture as much. But, I, but when I know what people have been stripped of, people that have their culture where everybody puts it down, right, they try to make, mold them into something else, I know the pain that they've gone through, right? So when I see that, I'm not trying to push, God, I'm not trying to push their culture down. Because I know that that's, that's their hurt. That's their pain. So you know what I pray for them? I pray, God, I hope that you can make them really cherish their culture and help them get past the pain that was caused to them all these years that make them want to hold on so tight. Even though they know your culture is better, that hurt, they're not over it yet. Does that make sense? So it's like, God, give me the patience to, to be there with them. Give me the strength to eat with them to do whatever, to embrace their culture and try it. Does that make sense? I never prayed that you guys would stop offering me tofu. <laughs> I prayed for the strength to be able to eat the tofu every time it was offered to me. And I have, right? I have yet to turn down tofu every time it's been offered. The youth even said, like, try some almond pudding tofu at Meat Fresh. I tried it last week, ate it, liked it. Right, it was good. Uh, I, was, I, I, went to, I got some pad thai on my vacation. Normally, I, I don't eat the, the tofu, right? But I accidentally forgot. All right, I now I put no tofu, right? So I don't go to waste. I forgot to put no tofu. Next thing I know, the whole plate was gone, right? I ate all the tofu and didn't even notice. I liked it, right? I was like, dang, man, like, what happened to me, right? <laughs> uh, so I, when I started the year, I had a motto, a tofu-free 23, all right? And so somebody instantly or eat, very early and easily broke me of that, so I had to eat tofu. And so I've been eating it all year, right? And so I was like, now my new, my, basically for this year is like a tofu-filled 23, is okay with me, right, right? Because <laughs> so, uh, I, I probably ate tofu eight times this year already, right? I'm keeping track. But that's how I looked at it. Like, how can I love this culture? How can I love these people? This is what they love, this is what they like. You tell me a story why you like this dish, I'll eat it with you. Does that make sense? I didn't ask you to change. I didn't say, hey, do this, do that. I'm going to meet you. Does that make sense? It seems simple, but that's why I said, like, food is, for most cultures, very important, right? And usually when somebody has a special dish, it is always pretty good. Right? Nobody has a favorite dish that's terrible. There's a few people like that out there, but they're, they're hard to love, but it's okay. Right? But that's what we're talking about. You finding ways to grow to love them. Does that make sense? Because every person has a hurt. Every person has a reason why that they're holding on to something. Every person has a reason that they don't want to let something go. And it's not for you to change that. Because I'm sure every one of us has something in us we don't want to change. Every one of us has something. Right? I, don't want to sh- I don't ever want to share emotions. I love to teach. I love to give practical stuff. That was, that's one of my flaws. When, if you ever look at it, it was like the people that I've trained all my life, they're like, well, he never really shared enough of the personal to really like, help in that little. And I was like, dang. Right? And so I've always tried. I'm trying to get better. Right? But that's what I'm saying. Like, I know that. Uh, and so, but th- that's what I said. To love, to do all that, you've got to go outside what you like. You've got to go outside your comfort zone. You've got to sacrifice for them knowing that they need it more. Does that make sense? 
If the church is all doing that, that's how we become perfectly one. When we're, when we're strong enough to love no matter what. That's Jesus' love. It ain't easy, but that's why you got to go to Jesus to get it. Does that make sense? This is why Paul says, you got to train yourself. you got to grow up in every way. Read his letters. He talks about that in Timothy, all his things. Train yourself up to grow. He repeats it in all, every book he has because he knows that's the only way it's going to happen. That's the only way people are going to love. And so I'm, I, I say, you guys love in a tremendous ways. No question. And I love that love. I've grown from that love. I'm saved by that love. But guess what? I'm an easy person to, to do with, right? I'm willing to try things. I'm open. I'm searching for life. I'm searching for that stuff. So it's easy for me to get it and receive it and grow from it. But most people don't know they need it. Most, most people don't think that, that there's, it's safe to do it, right? All these different reasons why it's hard to love them. That's where the believers have to then go further, go harder. So that I mean, that's why, and, that, and the only way we can do that is to grow up where we're at. If we're further along with Christ, it is that much easier to love them. Because he's the, he's the, the finest level. He is able to love every single person down, right? So if we're, too, if we're not high enough, we're not able to love far enough. That makes sense? But if we're going after Christ, we can get there. And so uh, today on the handouts, you'll see, like, I have a lot of different things, and there's also a link I sent. But basically, um, you have the read, read John 17 as an application, right? But uh, on the second page, it says emotional, healthy spirituality. You guys see that? All right. So for the youth leaders, we actually studied this book. We went through chapter, one chapter a month, right? But basically, if you read Paul's writing, especially in the section we looked at, he talks about people needing to grow up from children to adults, right? Every discipleship book, everything about growing in faith, it has these different levels. Child, adolescent, or infant, child, adolescent, adult, right? So you, you take some time to look at these categories. Take a time to read each one. And you're going to see there's areas that you're strong in, and there's areas where you're like, I'm very low, right? When we read this as leaders, I'll be honest, right? I, found, I had some stuff that was still in the children level. I still had stuff that was in the infant level, right? I read this book seven years ago in seminary. When I read it again with the youth leaders, I was like, I loved it when I read it in seminary. And I was reading it seven years later. I was like, I didn't put a lot of that stuff into practice, <laughs> right? I was like, I wanted to do it. I just couldn't do it, right? And so having, reading it as a group, it worked really well because we helped build each other up and we also held each other accountable, right? I need to work on this. Let's talk about it next month. Let's see how we did. And so that's where I said, like, it's important to understand that there's ways to look at your faith to see that there's ways to grow. There's ways to see how Jesus can hope, open your heart. Uh, because when you look at these levels, there's also something on the bottom that says signs of spiritual pride. Uh, basically, my first week of vacation, I was watching something called the Basics Conference. So it's a, it's a conference for pastors to renew their gifts, renew their strengths. Uh, you know, so it's like, go back to the basics, right? Fundamentals and get your people ready. The people were saying, it's time to stop fighting with your sheep, start fighting for your sheep. Right? That's what they were talking about. And the thing they talked about is the reason why it's so hard to like, love your sheep or do all that stuff is because you have your own spiritual pride. You think you're humble, you're not. You have pride. So you can see right here, it says signs of spiritual pride. You are, strong, you are a stronger Christian than others, more committed than others. It will happen to them, but not us, right? The way Peter said it. I know more. I give more. I serve more. I'm more stable. I'm more loving. I'm more mature. And believing you are stronger than others. That is a potential sign for spiritual pride. Another one is, you hear the words of Jesus for others, but not for yourself. Sign of spiritual pride. You no longer feel the need to pray. Sign of spiritual pride. You feel the entire work of Jesus rests on your shoulders. Sign of spiritual pride. Right? So that's why I said it's, you, there's plenty of resources for Christians to understand where they're at, how to grow, how to identify certain things, and then put the work in to get stronger. All right? And so hopefully you guys have a chance to look at this stuff. Um, one of the applications I put is like commit to doing a, Bible, a book study with, with fellow believers. Right? Uh, really well for our group. Uh, if you study church leadership books, it, the way you get your staff together is you study a book together. You find ways of what their beliefs, what their culture brings to the table, and it helps you understand each other more because you're actually looking at the same text and seeing what different interpretations you get out of it. Does that make sense? And then you can kind of work together, pray together. But it's important to do book studies together. So if any of you want to study this book, Emotional Healthy Spirituality, uh, over the summer we can do one, book, one, one chapter a month. And we'll do a book club where it's like, I call it the triple Bs, books, bonding, and barbecue. Right? So if you want to read the book, and, uh, but that's why it's, good to, it's good, easy to open up once you're eating barbecue. Right? Uh, <laughs> once you got barbecue sauce all over your face and shirt, you ain't worried about shame or worried about uh, your emotions. 
right? But if, if not, so I have, uh, I sent this link out to you guys. It's a Google Doc. It has all these different ch books. There's about four or five of them about how, like shaping your heart like Jesus, right? These are the books I've all read this year trying to grow. They're very good. They're good potential resources, right? We've been talking about being disciple, growing. So if you want to be disciple, that's a good book to see. You'll see the contents, what it's trying to shape you with. I uh, put a couple books that are actual discipleship books. Some of them are more like the personal connection. There's another one where it's like, how do you, uh, if you're going to make disciples, you got to make yourself a disciple maker, then you start making disciples, right? So if you like the logical stuff, take a look at it. See what's there. If you want that resources, I can share it with you, right? If you want to, if a couple people are like, hey, we want to do that book, I can organize you guys and say, hey, here's a book club. You all want to do that material. Does that make sense? But you have to start committing to growing. You need to grow together. You need to look at unity together. The back page of that one, it says, how personality types influence spiritual life. You guys see that big chart? Right? Some smart people, they uh, organize your personality types, and they identify what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, what your areas that can, you can be nurtured with, and areas that you need to grow. Because right? sometimes you feel like, where do I start? So you can put yourself in this boat. Right? I'm an I'm a INTJ, ESTJ. I was INTJ before I left for the Army. They made me become an extrovert. That's why my letter switched a little bit, because you can't be a leader by yourself, right? And so, but if you look at both those right through the middle, right, these are the gifts that they have. Insight, vision, inspiration, motivation, possibility, leadership, structure, goal direction, decisiveness, objectivity, and formulas. That's me, right? That's my strengths. Here's my weaknesses. Loneliness, restlessness, indulgence, overextendedness, yep, tunnel vision, impersonality, right? That's my weaknesses. It's right there. They're very accurate. Here's the ways I can be nurtured. Imaging prayer, symbols, creative writing, action, mental prayer, written prayer, rules of life. We just did this for the youth a week ago. I didn't realize that I did this afterwards. But I told the youth, I have, I'm terrible at rules of life, so I invited uh, uh, Danielle to share. Right? I was like, I need help in this. And so it's funny, after she spoke, I, I was reading this book again this week to prep for the sermon. I was like, it's right there. I need rules of life to nurture. Right? I was like, God, man, you good. God, you good. Right? Even the symbols. I just created a special garden in my patio. I call it the Garden of Gethsemane. But I basically have all this symbolism. Every flower, every single thing about it has a biblical significance with it to help me sense God's presence more. I was kind of laughing where I just built it because I like all those symbols, right? And it was like, here it is right there. That's what helps me, right? And that place has really helped me over these last, my, my vacation. I've been spending like four hours sitting around fireplaces. My propane bill is super high right now, but it's worth it, all right? <laughs> uh, but this is where growth needs. Right? This is where a lot of us ignore it, but it, it tells you what's the growth needs. Trust initiation, sharing insights, awareness, self-discipline, balanced life. That's not me. Right? Practice listening, seek feedback, reflection, flexibility, and surrender of gifts. Those are the weaknesses that I have. All right? Some of you that know me and my leadership style, I get a lot of feedback. I get a lot of um, put, put back, and I'm, I'm pretty flexible. Right? Most of you have said that. The reason why is because I know that those are my weaknesses. So I try as hard as I can to improve those areas. All right, so if you look on the, the email I sent this morning that Pastor Chang forwarded, there's also a survey form. It's a Google form that you can give me feedback for every area of ministry that I'm in. Right, we want people to be transparent. We want people to grow. We want to be able to give feedback and grow them. I will set that example. I will put myself out there. Right, so you can put, uh, so it has like youth ministry, Friday nights, Sunday sermons, all this other stuff, right? You can be like, talks too long in sermons. Yep, okay, improvement. I'll try to get faster. I got books to read to get better at sermons, right? I'm still working. I'm still growing. But so if you do me, please do me a favor. Fill out that survey form. Give me the feedback that I need that will help me grow, help me fine tune where God, what God, who God is making me to be. Does that make sense? So please fill that out. Uh, hopefully, you know, as you fill it out, I'm going to recruit some people. Hopefully I can get like seven people to help me go through all the recommendations to come up with a healthy plan to grow. Does that make sense? I don't need to grow by myself. That's not, how, that's not what the body is for. You're supposed to be unified, right? So I'm willing to put myself out there. I, I encourage you to look at this list for yourself. Look at your letters, right? Find people, but I, I will not ask you to do something I won't do, right? This is how we grow. This is how we, we, we get better. This is how we can love more. Uh, so this is where I'll end with, right? The, the, you know, grow, 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 grow. I got a little sidetracked. All right. Um, so this is, if you look at the applications, right, I, I did commit to reading a book together. Number 12, rate yourself, or the second application says, rate yourself on how well you love from 1 to 10, 
Look at the five love languages and give a score for each category. Come up with a plan to strengthen each to improve by two for each one. How many of you got, you know, everybody loves to talk love language. This is my favorite. This is one I like. Do them all. Right? Why would, why would you not give everybody five across the board? Does that make sense? Right? That just shows you the best way of giving it to them. Why would you not give all five? When I look at God, he gives more than that five. Right? And so one of the things that I, even for this, this church, right, really start encouraging each other. Really start sharing words of affirmation. Really sharing, like, positive things. Most of the time, all we do is share criticism. It's, yeah, how are you, how how you going to grow in love if you're only giving one side? Right? Grow in every single way. Grow in sharing stuff. Uh, for me, that's where I was saying, like, I'll, I'll try to end it with, like, sharing, you know, I think, uh, for me, right, I need, the peop- I need people to help me bring my passion back. Um, even for, like, eating. Like, I didn't eat a lot of meat. Like, I actually wasn't eating a lot before I, you know, when I first got here because I wasn't sleeping well and I couldn't train well. Right? And so for a long time, I couldn't eat a lot. That's why I said I wouldn't eat tofu because I can only have a limited appetite. I wasn't going to waste it on tofu. I'd eat meat. Right? And so... But just even being around people, right, sharing life, doing things like that, uh, I started competing with eating, right? And so as I was getting beat in eating, that's what motivated me to start eat, uh, training again, trying to sleep, and then I, you know, started getting my strength back. Does that make sense? So just that little fun thing where it's like, man, that, that's what I needed to help stir my passion back, right? Just competing, having fun. So I'm a born-again meat eater. It's like, thank you, <laughs> right? That's, that's, what, that's what God does. These little things of sharing love. You never know how these small things work. Does that make sense? I challenge everybody to try to compete so that if you beat me, I would eat tofu, right? And nobody ever took me up on it. Only one person cha- actually challenged me. And so that's where I was like, but I, I, I needed those things, right? I needed that quality time, things like that, of like doing things together to where I can get my passions back, right? So that's what I'm trying to tell you. Do all these things. You might have a strength or you might have a one that's the best, but everybody needs all five. Does that make sense? Everybody needs all five and when they need it, when they need it, all right? And so I, I, I encourage you. Grow in love every possible way. If you want to change everything around you, if you really want to see people be saved, really people come to light, there's only one way, and that's love. That's what Jesus, God, knew. What was their plan to save us? Act of love. I will come down and sacrifice it all. I will love them for who they are, where they're at, before they ever do anything. I will die for them. That is the level of love that we're trying to get to. And so I encourage you, do whatever it takes to get there. Not only for everybody else, but even for yourself. There is, not, there is no greater joy than feeling that love and then being able to just not hold it back. Does that make sense? So I appreciate you. Thank you for all that you've poured into me, and I really hope that you grow in your love. So please join me as we close in prayer.